Hello. Hello, hello, hello. I have adjusted cat cam. Live on Twitch. Thank you, Mr. Certainly. And looks like YouTube's happy. Bruce S. says hi on Discord. Thank you, Bruce. I thought this would be funny because Vin, the cat on the left, doesn't like it when I start talking. So I thought I would start with cat cam to see how long she stays there. Because I fully expect her to stand up and leave. <laughs> Awesome. YouTube told me it was scheduled for tomorrow at 5 a.m. Oh, you know what? I might have not set the schedule correctly. I started my checklist, um, but I don't think I actually correctly set the... I don't think I correctly set it, so that's my bad. Sorry about that. I just realized I also need to... Make sure my mic is unmuted. David asks, what's happening next week? You did tell us last week that today is the day. Next week, I think, will be Friday, and then the week after is actually going to be another Thursday. Um, because Vin, the cat on the left, who's yawning, can you see her teeth? Um, she's getting dental work done uh, two weeks from tomorrow. So I'm, I don't want, I'm going to be worried about her because she's got to, like, get actually like put under and teeth cleaned and teeth removed. So I, uh, I don't want to have to worry about her and be doing this at the same time two weeks from now. So next week should be Friday, I believe. And then two weeks from now, um, it's not. And see, she got up. I'll, I'll let her out. <laughs> I just, I knew that was going to happen. Okay. You can leave. I had a feeling that would happen. Okay, let me adjust cat cam here. Back to kind of where it's usually looking. Okay, so um, I did want to try something. Julie and I, and I were talking last time on the stream. Let me switch here. So uh, for the recording, because the stream ends up being like two plus hours, it would be good to have time codes. So I actually do have a doc and I will copy the link and put it in the discord. Um, so if anybody wants to help take notes as I talk, um, that's kind of a collaborative spot for us to do that. Um, Bruce says, I, Bruce S says, I just got another random ESP32 S2 board. Awesome. Yeah. I think there's just going to be a ton like uh, Wemo, Wemos. Just did a pull request as well. Let me turn my screen on. Um, so here's the notes doc. Um, and I have a template. It's very similar to uh, very similar to the way that we do the CircuitPython meeting. So it's like a collaborative Google Doc that um, if folks just have comments and time codes and stuff, like we could put it there and then I'll dump those in the YouTube description. So any help uh, with that is is very welcome. Um, this is a template as well, so I think I'll try to do that every week. If I hadn't run out of time, I would include some of the topics that I want to cover today. Um, yeah, so uh, we did get a pull request from Wemo. Is it Wemo or Wemos? Wemos here. So like adding their Lowland D32S2 board. And, uh, like they're a very big vendor, right? Like I've definitely heard of them before. So that's why Lamora just said like, Hey, like it's time for you to get a USB V Eddy. Um, and obviously we haven't heard from them, them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, we, we talked a lot about this last week. Uh, it's, it's new for a lot of folks coming into like native USB, um, native USB from the ESP world where you didn't have that. 
Um, okay, so what I do want to try to do going forwards is having a time uh, a list of things that I want to talk about in the in the notes here. So let's um, let's just do housekeeping, which I actually have notes for now. Uh, so I will actually turn my notes off um, and talk about that. So hello everyone, my name is Scott and I work on CircuitPython for Adafruit. Adafruit is a company that does open source hardware and software. Um, if you want to support me and you want to support Adafruit, who pays me to work on CircuitPython, you can go to adafruit.com. Uh, there's lots of interesting uh, development boards, little inexpensive computers you can use to control LEDs and buttons and all that stuff available from Adafruit. Uh, go there, uh, s help them out, and run the software that I work on there. Um, this deep dive uh, happens every week. Uh, I normally do it Fridays, but um, if for some reason I need to do something else on Friday, say I'm taking the day off or I have a lot of other things going on, I will shift it a day early to Thursdays at 2 p.m. like uh, this week. Uh, it typically goes for two hours or more, um, as you know. Sometimes I have a hard stop, but usually I don't, so it can be between two and two and a half hours. Uh, it's a long stream. Uh, we have a notes doc this week and hopefully every week going forward. So if you have uh, like just, I, oh, I talk about this thing and then that thing, that sort of thing, that's helpful. Uh, if you want to help out in the notes doc, I will try to have a timeline kind of in there as well. Um, but yeah, I'll also put notes there about uh, when the like, next one is probably happening. Um, I do blog it up at, like a day before or so. Um, so you can check the Adafruit blog as well for, for status updates there. Um, as always, if you have questions about what I'm working on or what I do work on, um, I'm more than happy to talk about other topics. Uh, these streams started as a way for folks to get into CircuitPython who are coming from the ESP32 side of things uh, because we're focusing primarily on the ESP32 S2. Um, I don't think I'm going to cover much of that week, but I'll go into that in just a sec after I get through the rest of my housekeeping. Um, the cat in the picture, his name is Spook. Uh, he is epileptic, which means he has seizures from time to time. Uh, so there is a chance that he'll have a seizure. He loves sleeping in the window, so I'm not going to take that away from him. Uh, and he's awfully cute as well. So um, if he starts hissing and then doing st some stuff, I'll mute watch him to make sure he's okay, and then unmute and keep going on the stream. Probably let him out of the room, too, because he gets real hot if he seizes. Um, so that's cat stuff. Um, and then lastly, if you want to chat with me and a bunch of other awesome folks uh, throughout the week, you can go to the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. Um, that's not on the screen, and I should probably add it. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we'd love to see you there. Um, I've got the gray. I'm backwards. This gray box is the Discord chat. And then the chat below that is the YouTube chat. I think it should be set up so you can see everything. Um, I do have a getting started checklist as well. So hopefully I will not forget things. Like last week I forgot uh, to change the titles. Um Okay, so that is all of the housekeeping. Um, if you have questions, as always, uh, let me know. Um, I'm just adjusting this off screen, keeping track of YouTube status. Um, okay, so let me, I'll pull up the screen and we'll just type in, um, We'll just type in what, what I was thinking we would talk about today. So we'll go to the desktop. This is the, the shared notes doc and uh, topics of the day. Um, I had a request from FedA2 uh, requested puzzle discussion. So I won't go into too much detail quite yet, but I made a puzzle with a die shot from an Intel 808. Um, so I will show that off. Oh, Barack says it was an earthquake in Turkey. Ooh, I hope everything's okay. We have earthquakes here too. Um, they can be scary. Um, request a puzzle discussion. We talked about the Wemos thing. Um, 
Oh, I want to talk about the uh, FPGA mock XO2 stemma board. Board status. And talk about. And the main thing I was thinking was talking about the request library, um, which I think I have a few uh, streams backwards, a uh, few streams back. Um, I want to talk about that as well and any other topics that come up. So, haha, <laughs> perfect. Somebody's putting my uh, Twitter status for the. Oh, uh, yes. I even have a tab open of something I thought would be interesting too. Um, CircuitPython naming history. So I was actually making these docs, uh, one doc for like, here's all the things I needed to do to get the stream going. And then also another doc for the like time codes of stuff. And I ran across this doc about discussion of what we were going to call CircuitPython, and I thought that would be really interesting. So um, let's talk about the puzzle, and then I will talk about the naming after that. And again, if you have questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, I'm happy to, like last week, we spent an hour and a half talking about display I.O., which wasn't on my plan, but I think it was all uh, really cool. So um, I'm totally, to you know me, I'm, I'm, I'm totally ready to take some side journeys. Okay, um, let's switch to the overhead. Hopefully it's still working. Um, so I actually have the overhead hanging off my desk. So this is the floor, this is my foot. Um, and the reason is, is because I have this puzzle. Let me grab this. So if I switch to here. So I had this idea. I was doing some puzzles in the pandemic because it's a non-screen activity to do. Um, and I found that Ravensburger uh, allows you to do custom puzzles. So you just upload a picture and you can get a puzzle made as a one-off from them. And now it's not as cheap as a regular puzzle. Um, it was like $55 total, um, which is a a bit much for a puzzle, but if it's a puzzle of exactly what you want, um, I think that's pretty neat. And I've, I've always been interested in um, silicon, like inter integrated circuit design. And so I uh, I saw that Ken Sheriff, who does a lot of die shots, had posted something, and I was like, hey, what would what would you use for a puzzle? Um, and because I realized when doing puzzles that you learn a lot about like noticing details that you wouldn't notice otherwise. Um, so I thought, like, how cool would it be to learn, like, the different structures of a an integrated circuit by doing a puzzle of one? So um, I asked Ken, and he suggested the Intel 8008, which I think is actually called the 808 from time to time. Um, let me switch back to the overhead. So I got it as a thousand piece. There, that's probably better actually. And uh, it's an Intel 8008, which I think is, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was debating whether I would put socks on or not. Um, I think socks were the right call. So uh, this is a die shot that Ken took of the 8008 and it's basically the right uh, aspect ratio for the puzzle. So I think what happens is that like they can just digitally print whatever image they have the standard like puzzle piece cut that they do on the on the thing after it's cut. So um, we could pull up the Wikipedia article about this more, um, but you could see the image, and then this is where this is the actual puzzle. So I don't know how to give a good perspective on how big it is, but you can see like with my hands, and I definitely wanted to start uh, from the outside because. You know, the challenge with a puzzle is taking out of those thousand, thousand pieces what pieces you think will connect up together. And the outside's pretty easy because of uh, it's blank. It's actually like gray. Um, and that makes it actually pretty easy. So let me show 
my strategy, my puzzle strategy. Yeah, I'll show a couple pieces in just a second. I'll, I'll show you the challenge of it. Um, actually, no, I, I'll do the reverse. So here's the inside. Um, and here's an example of a piece. Is that there? It focused. So what I was doing so far, and this came in it as well, but it's like totally not helpful. <laughs> like it, the only good reference image that I have, like physically, like I could pull up the original image that Ken gave me, but um, it's only really the front that that happens. Um, so yeah, so Ken did get back to me as well. I actually asked. Like, what are the orange squiggles? So, you know, typically in a puzzle, you want something with a lot of colors. And you want a lot of colors because it basically makes a thousand piece puzzle like less than a thousand pieces because you've only got like the puzzle pieces that have red on them, for example. So the challenge with this puzzle is that, as you can see, like the blue is just the back, but like so many of the puzzle pieces look kind of at first glance, very similar. Um, and my strategy actually has been to follow, ooh, like this piece. Um, I'm totally learning some of this stuff. It's, I'm learning both, um, I'm learning both like some silly, like IC structure stuff, but I'm also learning like totally unrelated things. Like the puzzle itself, if we look, if I just kind of show this, and you can't even see it in the print, but you can see it in the real puzzle, is that because of the way the picture was taken, like this portion of the puzzle is a little bit blurry. So like you can tell if a piece goes in this area because like it's not quite as crisp. I found the edges, like the edges are different as well. So like this edge and this edge have like a little bit more like gray and black on it. Whereas like the top two edges are like right up against it which is funny. Um, yeah, so I did a puzzle, a couple of puzzles back where the outside was all white and it's like really, really terrible. So I knew with this one, like there are some strategies that just work regardless. Um, yeah, Mark says that you need to get the CircuitPython 6 poster made. Yeah, I need to talk with Phil a little more. I think I'd rather have a, I'd rather have the poster as a puzzle than the poster as a poster. Um, but that's just me. Um, and I'll ask them about that. So another thing that I noticed is that, um, there's these orange squiggles that Alvaro is talking about. And I asked Ken and he said that they are, um, <sighs> I should just pull it up. But I think that they're, they're like part of a transistor structure. I don't know. I don't know a lot of, uh, I, I don't know a lot of, about how the process is, but um, like all these orange squiggles up here, the reason that they, I think, so th they have to do with high drive transistors. So like um, the orange squiggles are, hold more like charge. And so they can, they're part of transistors that can drive more stuff. Um, and so what, what made sense to me after learning that is that um, they exist a lot around the outside. So these big pads here, <laughs> like how I'm using my feet to show. Um, these are the the pads that the like bond wires from the package go to. So these are equal. These are usually connected to the pins that you would use on the outside, basically. Um, and you can see the like black dots. I think are actually the wires that have been either cut or or not. Um, so I think these orange squiggles live next to the pads because they've got to drive like. Uh, the pads themselves, which means they require more, remi require more charge. This puzzle is a thousand pieces. Brock is asking. Um, yep, and looks like Bruce just sent a link to the original image as well, uh, which is great. And maybe I can open the original, switch to the desktop. Yeah, so this is the original image. This is actually really interesting. I haven't looked at this yet. Um, to be able to compare. It is interesting because it, it looks like Ravensburger actually did some post-processing. Um, like if we just take a look at like, so what I've been, my, my strategy has been to follow the power rails. I, I assume that's what these are. I haven't actually confirmed it, but you can see here that like 
this big fat thing goes around here and around here and around here and like kind of trickles up and gets smaller and smaller as it goes around. And then this one does the op does a kind of a similar wind around. Um, I don't know if you could actually see that, but I'm looking for these these power rails here. And it, it it's interesting because when looking at this on the screen, there it's like not quite as I, I think of it as very colorful as it was printed out in the pieces. Um, yeah, Johnny says power rail. Yep. And then what? One thing that was also interesting is like this bit I've all I, I've done. Which, oh, I guess I should be doing desk. I could do desktop with overhead. Um, does that make sense? So like this is this top corner here, and like. I knew that I was kind of complete in this pattern because it's actually eight little, like there's like rectangular nubs on there. Um, yeah, so it's been an interesting challenge. Um, obviously, I have a lot of pieces to go. And basically what I've been trying to do is follow the power rails as they get smaller and smaller. Um, but at some point I'm gonna have to kind of change my approach and actually start to pick out um, other sorts of patterns that I'm seeing on the pieces. Like this is this piece and this like this piece is probably one that I can find in the image because it's got this like unique orange structure to it uh, along with that as well. In fact, that looks like <laughs> my wife was like, are you going to just stream doing this puzzle? And I was like, I thought about it, um, but no, I, I won't do too much. I'm just going to pick these pieces out and I'll do them later. So that's what all these pieces here are is like the ones that I think I could probably place now. Um, but yeah, so any questions about that? I know that's like super nerdy, uh, but puzzles are fun and puzzles are, are like, I'm definitely learning more details of the image. Some, some of which obviously has to do with how the image was taken, but also some of it has to do with the structure stuff. I think if I were to make this again, I might actually ask for like maybe some tinting or something so that like if this is the ALU which it might be I don't even know like maybe all of the pieces within like one section would have like a slight red or green or sort of tint um, something to help differentiate even more so yeah uh, thank you so much to Ken uh, Shira for for letting me uh, use his his picture there I, his reasoning for it was that like there's only he he was saying that there's 3,500 um, transistors on it, so it's like three and a half transistors a piece. So he was hoping that you'd actually be able to to see the individual transistors. I don't actually know what they look like, um, so I can't tell you if that's actually the case. Um, but yeah, if puzzles sound like a thing, I I kind of assume also that puzzles are going to be hard to source right now. Because, like, actually, like, a lot of people are buying puzzles. Um, but it turned out the custom one wasn't impossible to get, which is cool. All right. And I guess I should have taken a time code when I started talking about that as well. Any other questions? Otherwise, I thought we'd go to the... Yeah, Mark says puzzles were hard to get for a while, but I heard it improved. Yeah, I've been getting some from like a local spot here and it's not been too bad. And then what I do after I do them, I actually just put them out in like a little free library that we have out front. Uh, but with this one, I think once I'm done, which will be a while, although there is a point right where like, as you place more pieces, um, the number of unique pieces left goes down. So there's like this kind of cascading effect when you get it uh, done. Uh, the puzzle was made by Ravensburger, who's, I think, a pretty big name in, yeah, pretty big name in puzzle making. Like, they they make decent puzzles. It's not just, like, some random Chinese company. It's actually, like, German. And I think somebody, I think a German guy actually made the same puzzle. So I'm curious to see how it goes for, for them. Um, but, yeah, it's called My Ravensburger. Um, and you can just go on there. You can do up to a 1,500-piece puzzle, but the, like, dimensions of the puzzle... I mean, it's a harder puzzle as well, and lar larger, I think. Um, but yeah, 
Are you trying to show us your gray socks? Yes, I'm using them to point out features of the puzzle. Uh, my gray socks. You won't have to look at my gray socks the whole stream, though. <laughs> I figured gray socks were better than my feet. Um, okay, so that's the that's the puzzle. It's been really interesting. I'm like trying to get to this area as well, um, but it's it's pretty tricky. It's not not an easy puzzle by any any stretch of the imagination. I wonder if it shows like how this is kind of does that look like the same? The orange, the yellows and oranges seem pretty pretty similar. I noticed they also make replacement pieces in case you're missing some from another puzzle. Interesting. Somebody was like, what if I want this puzzle, but it, I don't want it as hard? And some places, I don't think Ravensburger, but they, they allow you to do double-sided puzzles. So if you wanted a puzzle like this, but didn't want to have the challenge of putting it together, you could put like something really easy on the back and then something really hard on the front. Um, but yeah. Okay, let's... Let's move on. We're about half hour in. So let's see. 2623. Um, so I just stumbled across this doc and I know we talked. I, I watched Unexpected Maker's stream from Tuesday and uh, there was some discussion about MicroPython versus CircuitPython. It's something we've talked about here before, so I don't want to go into great detail about it. Um, but, you know, when it came for us to deciding that like we want to live like the project the fork that we have wants to be um like we want to have it separate for a longer t period of time we realized that um we wanted to rename it from adafruit micropython to something that wouldn't be shortened to micropython because the challenge with that is then they're basically the same thing um so yeah uh what we had to do is decide what we wanted to call it. And I just stumbled across this doc and I thought, um, I thought I would talk about that, but let me, Emmett just asks, are you using windows OS at all or only Linux? I'm using Linux now. I do have windows installed just for, um, I, I have windows on this box as well. And I, I, uh, can, like reboot into it and I use it for playing video games, but I don't really, I don't use it for coding or anything. Um, okay. So here's this doc that I found. This is what, uh, Phil dropped in here after we made a decision, um, says, thanks all for the smarts input and thoughts. We collectively decided with Lamore and it is Adafruit circuit Python. So that was put at the top. And then here's a, a kind of a list of suggestions that we had. Um, and then we had some notes about like what we were going for. Um, somebody, everyone could say it's confusing with bare MicroPython since the term is a subset of the derivatives name. Ubuntu Linux versus Linux is okay because Linux isn't used, actually used on its own. And Ubuntu is very unique. Um, and then if we look at this list, we have Ada Python, Blinky Python, Circuit Python, Kibi Python which is the like 1024 vi version of, or no, what is it? Kibby Python. I don't, I forget what Kibby is. It's some sort of like metric prefix. Micro Playground, Micro Python, Adafruit Micro Python, Adafruit Nano Python, Micro Python Adafruit Edition, Micro Python Adafruit, Micro Python for Adafruit devices, and Micro Python for Adafruit hardware or Maker Python. We're all examples and, uh, what we settled on was circuit python. Kibby python I think it was the one that I I was pushing for as well. But I think circuit python actually came up in the discussion pretty early. What is kibby? <laughs> it's a food. Ah, I'm thinking of the binary prefix. It's just like Kilo, except it's the, the base two version. Yep, Kilo, but SI. Thank you, Alvaro. Yeah, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Maybe, maybe y'all would find that interesting, but let's 
no questions in the chat, so let's keep going. Um, what's this? Ah, okay. This is the, the meat of what I wanted to talk about today and potentially get some work or not. Right. Two to the two to the ten versus ten to ten to the ten, I think. Something like that. All right. Oh yes. Let's talk about this first. After I take a time code. So I did get um I had showed it off before. Let me switch to let's do it here. And I'll do it product mode. So I showed this off on show and tell, but this URL doesn't go anywhere. I should make it go somewhere. But this is the uh, Stemma Mock X02 board. Hopefully I can get it. It's a little dark. Um, can you see that? Is that too? There we go. That's probably good. So it has the two stemmas on the bottom, lo voltage regulator, logic level, a mock XO2, and then it has the debug edge connector, not the final version of it. But um, yeah, so the idea would be, I was thinking about this as it's a inexpensive FPGA that you can basically use for glue logic, which is one of the uses that people have for it, which is it can interface with potentially higher speed signals and kind of buffer them for a microcontroller, which is not always deterministic. Um, it can also do things like uh, basic logic, like and and nots and stuff like that. So I was thinking that, um, I was thinking that actually the kind of killer feature for this board is like very basic circuit Python libraries for just making this like three NAND gates or three NOR gates, um, which is these kind of the classic glue logic, which is the 7400 series. Um, 74 Wikipedia 7400 series. So this is a cool list. So you can see that like, oh, this 74x00 is quad to input NAND gate, for example. And you can see a sample data sheet. And so the idea would be that you would take this FPGA and basically re-implement. Oh, thank you. So here's the Wikipedia list for um, the 7400 series, which is kind of like a very famous series of integrated circuits um, that was really like very commonly. Um, who does the PC assembly? Uh, do you mean like putting the parts on here? I, I did it by hand. So it's definitely not super pretty. Uh, it also doesn't work. <laughs> so I... I put it on there, the power LED comes on, but uh, I wasn't able to do an I squared C scan and find the the mock XO2. So I've got some debugging to do on that, um, which is what I should say. Um, but what I want to do and the thing that I think is like, if I could sell this board for 20 bucks, like it's 256 or 1200 gates come in this package. So you can put both two, two sizes of FPGA on it. And uh, basically what I want is like a wide variety of easy to use CircuitPython libraries it, that would basically like basically like by default, you would have libraries that just implement 7400 series logic. Um, and you may say if you if you've ever bought 7400 series logic, like why in the world would you spend $20 on a chip that can do that when the chips themselves cost like 25 cents? And I think the answer is, is that this would be a board that could do all of the different or many of the 7400 series different logic um, and kind of do it dynamically. So instead of having to buy two copies of 25 different 7400 series boards, what you would do is you would um, buy one of these or two of these, however many you need, and then program them to be what you think they should be. Ah. I have some of these Boolean bits. 
They don't sell them anymore, but it's quite nice to make something simple on a breadboard. Copy that. Interesting. Yeah, so these are breadboarding uh, different logic gates as well. Which I don't remember what the, the logic is. Um, but yeah, instead of, instead of being like a lot of different things that are all fixed function, it would be one thing that is dynamic. And, and in order to get the value, what you need is you need a wide selection of libraries that you can just program it and use immediately. You don't have to do any sort of like tool chain stuff. Um, you don't have to, uh, like that's the thing, that's the work that I think needs to be done, which is given uh like n me gen design have your um like your ci your continuous integration when you update the library it automatically builds the bitstream files and then like package packages them up so the people using it don't actually need to have the like fpga tool chain at all um yep yeah alvaro points out that the the bitstream or the bit, what are they called? The Boolean bits are super easy uh, PCB designs to to do. Emmett asks, do I do you have any experience with FPGAs? I don't have a lot of experience. It's something that I've been curious about for a long time, uh, but I've not done a ton of work with them. Um, Lady Ada's carried some FPGAs on the Adafruit store and not been. They haven't sold that well, so she's she's very hesitant to to spend time on it. But I think there's like a lot of people that are interested in the higher end of FPGAs, and they're and that's really where I lived for a long time, and I really pushed them of like, oh, I want to do a completely new system on a chip. I want USB. I want RAM. I like I want to run Circuit Python on it. And I think what I realized is that I got to take two steps back. Uh, because that's costly. Like to get something that can even begin to compete with a cheap microcontroller for CircuitPython, you have to spend a lot on the FPGA. Uh, because so many of the resources in the chip itself are dedicated to like running the FPGA, that it's like way less efficient, like chip wise, like silicon wise, to to be configurable like an FPGA is, versus an ASIC, which is like a regular microcontroller we run on. Um, so what I what I decided is that like the way to go is actually like go really low cost so that you can get in and experiment for 20 bucks, but um, be a peripheral rather than being like a, a, a full system on a chip. Um, and then the neat thing is, is that this this is all my pitch, right? Like and I haven't made this happen. But the idea is that um, if you have a low cost FPGA where you have like some very basic logic that runs and does something for you. Like you can always move that logic into a larger FPGA if you want to. Um, so it's by having something low cost and treating it like a peripheral, I think is the right way to go. So that's why with this design, like I'm going I squared C, right? Like this is meant to be kind of like a stemma. Right, like it's going to be the equivalent of a stemma, but it can be flexible logic for it. Um, so that's what I'm thinking, but it's not high on my priority list because as I said, like Lamore's not really into it. Um, it's more just something that's interesting to me. Um, so yeah, if anybody wants to take a look at that, uh, let me know. And Alvaro points out iStudio. iStudio is a cool like... Um, I think you can connect the, co the components and stuff. Um, so I can't promise you that it works, um, but it is on my... Uh, so Chickadee Tech is my company. So I, I'm a contractor for Adafruit. Chickadee Tech is... I actually started before I worked for Adafruit uh, when I was doing like more hardware stuff. But if you do want to like order the board for yourself, here are the files. Uh, it doesn't work, so maybe wait until I have it uh, brought up. Um, but if you want to find my error and, and order it, then you're welcome to do that as well. 
Um, yeah, Mark Olson says, I have an RD Z7 that's like $200, but it's so hard to get started. Um, I really want to learn FPGA, but something that's smaller is much less scary to start with. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, <laughs> David said, so we can invent a new 7400 series that never existed. So this is also one thing that, that I think is kind of interesting in that... Um, if you have all these libraries that are individual 7400 series components, what you could actually do is then merge them together, right? Like you could take that design and put two 7400 series logics like in the same chip, right? And that could be the building block that where we go from like, this is the thing that you just loaded to this is the, the thing that like you start um, adding more, more logic to. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm looking at. Um, I think it could be cool. It just takes time, right? It takes it takes time to bring new hardware up, and and most of the time, I think for all this FPGA stuff, I'd love to do is actually like software side, in the same way that um, in the same way that. Uh, like circuit python is so much software stuff like it's or in what i was going to say is in the same way that we have like a co cookie cutter for circuit python libraries i want to have a cookie cutter for um i want to have a cookie cutter for like fpga libraries that like package it all up put the bit streams in there so that like you can just load the package which is like the python file and the bit stream and then say, make this I squared C thing that, and it makes it that, right? Like, I don't want you to have to worry about like installing ICE tools and doing all that. Um, Mark asks, are you okay with me selling your Feather Sala thing and this demo mock X03 32 bare boards on Tindy for EU buyers? Um, yes, but please take the logos off and the URL off because um, I will not support them. So yeah, that's kind of generally my policy. And that's the policy that um, Peter Esden has about uh, one bit squared as well. Like, you can do anything with my open hardware, I don't care, but don't put my trademarks, like my brand on it. Because uh, I will not, I, I don't want to support it. And I don't want to, one of the other tricky areas is like, if somebody does produce a copy that has your brand on it, then it's not... It makes it harder for people to know that, like, no, that's not actually supported by me. Like, maybe I never made it in that solder mask, for example. Um, so, yeah, if you're going to support it, take my logos off, put your logos on. That's fine. Um, it doesn't bother me. Like, both of these things are things that, like, will probably never see broad distribution. <laughs> so if, if you want, if you think it's cool, then then that's all good. Ryan says you could pitch it as a cricket style stemma board that you could be used as a PWM, LED driver, GPIO expander, etc., depending on the library used. Um, yeah, so that's like kind of what Seesaw is already for us, right? Like, uh, where am I? So if we go to Adafruit. And I think this is actually an option as well. Like, we could take the same approach. Um, like the seesaw is okay, Hercules. You're not helping the discussion at all. Um, so seesaw is like some stock firmware for a Cortex M0 that kind of does what you're talking about. So there's like some protocol over I squared C, just like Cricket, actually. That's exactly what Cricket is. Um, there's some protocol over I squared C that allows you to decide what it's doing. I think what I would change and, and you could do it for this model is actually like what you really need is an I squared C bootloader, right? Like instead of having one set firmware that does all these things, um, instead what you do is, uh, instead what you would do is like if you could do bootloading of, uh, these small microcontrollers over, um, I squared C, I think that you could do a lot of the same things. Now microcontrollers have complexity, right? And I think, that's also the appeal for me for FPGA is that like it's less complex. Um, uh, 
Uh, so Folknology says, so only one chip at a time. Yeah, so I think basically I want to build, it would be building an ecosystem for redistributing uh, your bit streams, your gateware to other people. And like the bootstrapped version that I think would be useful from the start is just by having mimics of 7400 series logic that people could use. Um, but I also want to, like, if people want to dig in, right, like they want to dig into the open source source stuff, um, then what you would want is you would want, uh, you would want, um, uh, oh God, my brain. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> What I did think of is that I think my brain's a little out of it today because I got my flu shot yesterday. So get your flu shot. Don't stream the next day. Um, but it's good for everybody to have a flu shot so that uh, the flu won't be spread around as well. Um, Dylan says, I've been wondering about logos on open source hardware for a bit. Would it be better to remove them from the source to begin with so that you do not need to worry about others forgetting slash not wanting to remove the logo who may want to reuse and resell the design. Yes, yes, that would be a better way to do it. And I think that's actually how Peter does it for one bit squared is that like he leaves like all these placeholders on the board that say like null or something. Um, and then very at the very last stage, he goes in and replaces all of those things with like his actual branding. Um I'm not, like, Mark asked me about it, so I expect Mark to, like, re follow my wishes. Um, but, like, for my personal designs, like, I don't sell any of them. So if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I bought this off Tindy, can you help me? I'll be like, I don't sell on Tindy, so I can't help you. Like, ask the person you bought it from. Um so I'm not too not too worried about it because I I don't support my hardware, um, but I think it's 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 like the right way to do it is to take to take my logos and stuff off of it. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. The the name is um, the 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 reason it's Stemma Mock XO32 is because it's the 32 pin footprint. I confused myself with this because there's Mock XO3 and Mock XO, XO2. Um, but the 32 and the design name is actually for the 32 pin footprint because you can put, both put a 256 lookup table version and a 1200 ish uh, lookup table version in the same footprint. So I actually have like. I have this tiny FPGA there. Like it's basically that board with a st with the Stemma connector logic as well. And uh, yeah, so it's just like very I squared C focused. Um, I'm going to open this window and cool it down in here. All right, any other questions about that? I'm a few messages behind. But yeah, so I just hand assembled it and I mean to post a picture of the hand assembly because it's not perfect, but you know, like hand assembly is never gonna look as good as, as pick and place version. David says, this could be electronic preservation. Some components will disappear. If you want to rebuild a very old personal computer and one chip is missing, you can replace it with some FPGA repla replacement piece. Yeah, totally. And actually, that's kind of what I'm, is driving my desire to do FPGA work. It's also having the ability to be, um, like, ver have very wide um, pin count stuff. So, like, on a Commodore 64, they have an edge connector for a cartridge and like how, what tools do I need to be able to interface to that? What tools do I need to be able to interface to like, I had these old eighties era, like electronic piano keyboards, like, and they have key matrix scans and like, how do I preserve that? Like 
preserve that circuitry, but also, oh, let me switch. Oh, wrong button. Uh, did you lose me? I hit the product showcase set on. There we go. I don't think it was following my face. So yeah, okay, let's keep going. I want to get back to that, but it's not urgent. I think there was something else I was going to do tonight. Um, okay. 5032. So, where did I leave off last week? I don't even remember. We talked about... I don't think I was actually doing anything. Um... One thing that I've been doing a lot of is UF2 work. And I think I, sh I showed that off, um, which is UF2 ESP32S. Uh, I made a pull request, and uh, it's been merged. So we now have multiple flash size support in there. Um, there was some problems. I added the Feather S2 from Unexpected Maker and uh, this bootloader, this version of the bootloader doesn't support, oh, let me, I took a time code, but let's actually call this UF2 discussion. Um, because I, I can <laughs> rant a little bit. Um, so I was trying to do the unexpected maker, the, the Feather S2 definition as both a test for um, as a test for the 16 megabyte version. So when you flash the UF2 bootloader, it flashes both the partition table and the bootloader into the factory spot. Um, <laughs> David says, this is becoming too serious. Checklist, list of topics, timestamp, seriously, seriously, what is happening to you? Um, I think it's just a matter of, like, refining over time. I'm, like, totally game to, like, go off on tangents still. I just want to know when I do. Uh, so that, like, people watching it or referring to it uh, later can get more value out of it. Um, but, yeah, so so let's just uh, keep track of where we, where we go. <laughs> um... Yeah, so I was kind of, uh, uh, I was unhappy. Um, Johnny says it's the flu shot. Um, I was a little unhappy because the Feather S2, which I have a pre-release version, courtesy of Unexpected Maker, um, it's got a dot star on it. Um, which is an, also known as, like, that's the Adafruit brand. It's an APA 102 based on the manufacturer. And uh, I wanted to have the bootloader support on here um, so that, like, if you're in the bootloader, it shows up as red when the USB is not connected and then goes green when it is. Um, I wanted that working, but unfortunately... Um, this version of the UF2 bootloader doesn't have support for it. So we have other versions. If we look in here, uh, we if we just do UF2, like we've got a SAMD version, we've got ESP32S version, we've got an STM version, uh, we have tiny UF2. There's also an NRF version, but obviously it doesn't have UF2 in the name. Um, but this tiny UF2 is really the what I wanted to be the future. And it's just like, we haven't gotten there. And if you want to help, that would be awesome. But I really want to move us to a world where the UF2 bootloader is one repository and has uh, all the hooks out into the individual ports, like very much so like tiny UF2, right? Like tiny, not tiny UF2, but tiny USB. Um, tiny USB is one common USB source for all of these different backends. And it's like, I'd really like it if we had the same thing with the bootloader. I would like the bootloader, all of the code that manages like the LEDs, for example, to make sure that like, or to make sure that like all the LED behavior is the same across all of them. 
So I'm pushing Tack a little bit. Um, he's busy now, so it's not going to happen immediately. Uh, but yeah, I would love, uh, and Johnny can help with this too. Like, and I, I love your opinion. Like, I would love to be able to have one source repository for all you have two bootloaders, um, so that they work the same. Like, there's so much value in things working the, exactly the same way, um, which I guess is can be also a kind of a yeah, and that's the problem. So Folknology asks, how does this UF2 stuff play with the ESP IDF? And I think that's um, that's the reason that, that, that TAC did this as a separate thing, is that the IDF has its own build system, it has this component structure, and that's just like, it's such a, it's such a like chip manufacturer thing to do, right? Like, they provide all this software, which is amazing, but they kind of assume that like you're only going to use it with their stuff, and like we're in this weird position where, like, we're trying to build software that works across things, um, and so the answer is not well because they have their own build system, um, and with Circuit Python, like I've kind of like bodged it together so that like our build system works with. Uh, with the IDF's build system, but it's not great. And some folks have seen that like it's pretty fragile. Um, so it doesn't work that well, but it's possible. And I think that like that instability and not working that well is worth the benefit of having things work identically on the from the like once you have it built, it works the same sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it's tough. It's it's a lot of work and. In my back of my brain, I have this like desire to come up with a build system that excels at this level. Um, Kevin says, I ordered a few ESP32 S2s to test the build for CircuitPython. Awesome. That would be super helpful. Um, Anic Data, shout out to you. You've been a huge help um, with testing of requests. Okay. People are typing, but I'm going to try to transition to the thing that I, I mainly wanted to talk about. So um, I did this big PR to requests. So this is not that. A different requests. So this is our version of the very, very, very popular requests library for Python. Um, so there's this, this is the, the source version. This is the thing that we're trying to mimic. Um, and this library does a pretty good job. Um, but when I was doing native Wi-Fi, I kind of came up with this model for sockets that doesn't match the model of like circuit or C Python sockets. Cheers, Alvaro. He's going to take a look later. You're welcome for showing the puzzle. It's fun to fun to share with folks. Oh, nice. And uh, Mark's updating my design for... I hope the design works. I don't know why it didn't work. So all bets are off on, on what's happening there. Okay, so... As is CircuitPython's MO, when something exists in CPython land, our goal is to be a strict subset of it. So you can take um, a library from CircuitPython or code from CircuitPython and use it on uh, use it on in CPython and it just works. Now, there's a lot of different kind of components to pulling that off when it comes to networking. There's socket. Uh, which is the lowest level, like how do you send and receive TCP bytes? There's uh, requests, which is the opposite end of, of that. And then um, there's a piece that doesn't exist in CPython, which is like, how do you manage what uh, network, you're, network you're on? And we've talked about all this, but the socket thing is like, how you manage sockets, we're doing a little bit differently in CircuitPython. Because like, in C in C Python, there's one source for sockets, and those 
like even if you have a cell connection and a Wi-Fi connection, like it's all managed under the hood by the host OS. Um, but in CircuitPython, that's not the case. Like we want sockets to be able to be provided by a pure Python library that's talking UART to another device or something. Um, so we had to like slightly deviate to like how you manage sockets in CircuitPython. And then uh, we, we have like, this is all this work that I've been doing is like take two, like the second take at all this stuff because we had the ESP32 spy library um, that implemented socket stuff on top of an external ESP32, um, which is the, have I talked about this before on the, on the stream? I don't, I think I have, I think I did, maybe not, I don't know. Let me know <laughs> if I'm recapping stuff. Um, yeah, so the challenge here has been like, I designed the core CircuitPython stuff to match CPython sockets. And then I updated requests. Okay, yeah, Folk Knowledge says I think I have talked about this. I updated requests to work with that, and I also updated requests to work with CPython sockets, which has been amazing. Um, and I also added some unit tests so that like I could try to start to wrap my arms around this like giant like critical library um, that is so from uh, requests requests to use as ESP32 spy or native Wi-Fi or the cell connection stuff yeah Johnny says it's familiar too uh, so I'll talk about the yeah Charles says that's the coprocessor stuff yep yeah so I, I'll try not to <laughs> Johnny says unit test for the win. Yeah, we did talk about this. That's right. We did unit test when Johnny couldn't make the stream. Um, so yeah, what happened is that I released it. I merged it. I released it. And there have been some bumps. Um, there have been some issues with requests. And uh, Anic data has actually been a huge help uh, helping find some of those. And both... Like the challenge of it is that it can requests interfaces with the new native Wi-Fi stuff. It interfaces with the old ESP32 spy stuff. It interfaces with the old other socket implementations I haven't even thought about yet. Um, my approach with the request changes I made was like hope, hoping that like I could add enough code in there to be backwards compatible. So like adding a get function call at the top level that creates a session by default that you can just call like you would have called the previous stuff. Um, but what I've been running into and, and anecdata has been helping find is like, I built that, new, I, I tested that new version of requests with real sockets, right? I tested it primarily with CPython sockets. Then I made the, then I made the, um, the mock socket thing work um but there's like this whole other area that i haven't tested which is like using the new requests with the old esp32 spy library and so there's been a couple issues there um and that's been i th i hope we're to the point i i need to do more testing is the gist of it um and the question becomes for me is what am I using to do more testing? Am I going to do, I, I there's a fork in the road that I'm debating and I can't really decide. Um, because the challenge, one of the other challenges with doing the ESP32 spy stuff is that because there's a coprocessor, there is also this, um, Ah, yeah, Mark can, yeah, I can't do that now, but I probably didn't push the mock exo symbol. I'll just do it now. Take a time code. Uh, let's take a detour since Mark's working on stuff. Detour to push symbol. All right. Uh, Pause that on requests. Let's just take a look in my... Uh, da, 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 da. 
da, 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 da. <laughs> I still do that. Stella. Lock X2, get status. Okay, so I've got stuff. So FP light, light table is the footprint stuff. And then I have two sub modules. And this is why Mark can't find the symbol, is that I haven't updated these sub modules. Uh, get commit M two by four. It popped up my G wanting my GPG password to sign the commit, which I should be able to copy and paste. Yep, and then I'm just gonna do another copy. <laughs> I made that mistake, pasting in a password later. That's it's not good news. So now I see. All I have to do, I don't have to push it to the main place. I can just push it to my own fork and then um, commit it and it should pull down. Yeah, this is git submodule detour, which could be good. Um, anybody want to talk more about git submodules? David, I told you I would go on a detour. Um, debug edge. I could just push it, but I don't want to do that. Da, da, da. Here. <laughs> Dylan's here for it. Awesome. Let's fork it to my own. Micro's here for it too. Sweet. Microdev. Okay, so now I have my own fork. And I'm going to add it as a remote. So I copy the SSH version, because that's how I do authentication. And I can do git remote add tan new paste. Ha, see, I'm glad I made sure. And now if I do git remote, you can see what I'm doing here. Now I can do git push tan new main. And I haven't SSH, so there we go. And okay, I'm behind, so I don't have the updated stuff. So I'm just going to cheat for a while. Yeah, Folknology says Adafruit CircuitPython bundle is a bit of a nightmare use of submodules. Yeah, understanding the way submodules work is, is helpful. Um, huh. I'll just force it. Because it's my own. I wouldn't force it if it was other. I probably need to merge it in. Um, I'm pushing debug edge because I made a new footprint for that. Uh, both of them were not. Uh, yeah. So now debug edge has new commits. And when it has new commits, you can do this. The other thing you want to do. So what I did is I I was originally the sub module was tracking uh, origin. Yeah, and two by four exists now. I'm just trying to be expedient here. Um, I guess I could have downloaded the new version too. I'm you're not confused. I'm just behind the times. I'm behind the times on debug edge stuff. Um, <laughs> so there's also Git modules, and this is the thing that tells uh, Git where the module lives. So here I'm going to do temporarily. <laughs> Mark's not going to like this. But now I can say get debug edge from my version and not from the main version. And actually in CircuitPython, tie this back to the S2, that's what we do for the IDF as well. So like CircuitPython's IDF copy actually is snagged from my fork of the IDF, not from the Espresso fork. Um, Git magic never do this at home. I do this at home. I'm at home right now. Um, so going to do that. And that should be all of what we need to do there. And I think we also want to do git submodule sync. 
uh, which I think synchronizes the dot git modules file to the like the internals versions of that. Dylan asks, is there a rule of thumb for when you should or shouldn't use sub modules in Git? <laughs> and Mark also asks, is there anyone in the chat who isn't at home right now? That's a good question. Um, I don't know a good rule of thumb for sub modules. I tend to like them. They're kind of like all of other things in Git where once you kind of get it integrated into your workflow, it's not too bad, but it can be kind of rough. Uh, it can be kind of rough before you do that kind of learning curve. Um, so I think there's good uses for it. Like we use it a lot to like pull in. In CircuitPython, we use it to pull in dependencies. We like tiny USB, for example. Um, the nice thing about Git sub modules is that in the outer Git repository, so like for the Stemma mock it, Mach 32 in this case, like it keeps track of what commit uh, of the other repository it's using. So if the other thing changes, you don't get behind uh, or you don't like automatically get updated. You, you, you have the ability of being very deliberate in when you update. And maybe, maybe we should update TinyUSB. We could do that today. Somebody just asked for that because there's a bug fix. Um, yeah, so if we see git status, so I would say, I don't know what your alternatives are. I guess that's one of the things with submodules is like, I don't know what you'd use instead. Um, Bruce S. points out Zephyr uses West to get their dependencies, but I think West under the covers is doing submodules still. Um, yeah, one thing that trips people up as well is that you want to do git submodule. So after you check out something new, you also want to do a git submodule update because all of the references of the submodules don't get updated when you check out something new. Um, we like literally have a pull request right now where like the pull request includes all of the frozen modules because like they got updated, but the person who made the PR didn't update them, um, which is annoying. So always look at git status is what I have to say. Git status is your friend. Look, I almost ran it a second time in a row. <laughs> There's also a bug in TinyUSB for this STM32F1 that I need to add a fix for. Yeah, fixes to TinyUSB are super helpful. Um, okay, let's actually do what we were trying to do. So let's do the keycad libs. So here you can see that I... So in here I have a components folder and a footprints folder. And this is actually, I think, a be best practice for keycad repositories is using sub modules for like shared um i need a git status button on my keyboard i my, i just type it like automatically even when i don't need it so i i don't think i need a separate button I just it's so ingrained in my brain um but i think this keycad lives process of having the libraries as a sub module is like a pretty common um it's a pretty common uh, approach. So, uh, and then within that library, I have components, which is the schematic side. So like when you're looking at the diagram of what the circuit is, like components holds footprints. Uh, footprints. Footprints are the, like what it actually physically looks like on the PCB. Um, so here you can see if we do get status again, um, I have modified the lattice.lib folder. Um, hmm. Bruce says, I don't think Wes uses submodules. They use multiple repos under one tree. Or at least that's the elevator pitch. I thought that's what submodules were. Uh, but I could be wrong. Um, okay, so we're just going to add it. We're going to commit it and say add mock exo symbol to symbol. Hi, me six. I'm glad you slept in. Sleep is important. You can always watch the rest later. And we're adding time codes today, so you could just look at like the description later to see everything that we talked about. Um, so we're going to commit that. And then what I'm going to do is instead of doing it as a fork, because it's my own repository, uh, what I'm going to do is 
uh, I'm going to create a different branch. So I won't have to update git modules because it's from the same repository, remote repository. It's just going just gonna to be on a different branch, um, which I guess like I don't actually need to do. I could just do it to the main one, which I think is still master on this. Um, I'll just have to integrate it later. Oops, what did I call it? Origin, Ugh. ah, here, we're doing git stuff. Git remote rename, ah, it's because it's a submodule. So by default, submodule is, um, the, it tracks, it, it names the remote as origin. So I don't actually wanna rename it because that'll mess up the submodule mechanics, I think. Um, yeah, that's unfortunate. I could make a second remote with the same name, but whatever. Okay, git push origin master. This is like my own repo, so I'm just gonna push straight there. And now if, uh, nope, Mark won't get it yet, because if we get status here, we actually have to still commit to the outer repository, the library updates. So it changed to orange, which means there's no more not staged stuff. And then we do git commit uh, update sub modules. Include everything. Wabam, and then we git push. And I don't set the remotes up that well, so I also just do like git push. I think in this case it's actually Chickity. Yeah. So now if Mark, he would fetch from origin and then check out master and then submodule update. And it should work. <laughs> okay. That was a good detour. I think people struggle with Git, so... Uh, talking about that. Nice. Me6 is getting their hot air station. Okay. Where were we? Just, uh, come on. 32 board. Can you tell I'm procrastinating? Back to requests. Okay, so I was talking about the challenges of getting requests working with uh, the ESP32 spy library. And the ESP32 spy library in and of itself, <laughs> Emmett Ray says, no get, just old tar, tar and gzipped patches. Uh, no thanks. Git has a learning curve, but I'm definitely like indoctrinated now. I'm, I like Git. Um, the additional challenge of the ESP32 spy stuff is that it also it, it has a coprocessor. It has all of this code running on a separate chip uh, that you're interfacing with, and it's also pretty bad at conveying error messages. Um, good. The schematic looks good now. Um, if errors happen, if you I don't, if you've ever used ESP32 Spy, and you see this error, expected one but got zero or something like that, it's like super cryptic, super annoying. Uh, but what it's saying is that the first thing that the the Wi-Fi Nina firmware res responds with. Let's just go to Nina. Yeah. So this is the firmware that is running on the ESP32. And uh, the main interesting stuff, I don't think I've covered this, is this command handler.cpp. And it's actually Arduino code. We can see it here. The code itself originates from Arduino. And then this is just the Adafruit fork of it. Um, 1.70. I thought I had 1.61 still. 
maybe there's a new one. So there's all these functions and they fill out this response things. And the, the third byte is the number of parameters. So when you see that um, cryptic error that says expected one but got zero, it's saying I got zero parameters, but I expected one. Oh, anecdote, it says the new one has BLE. Does it work? I, th I thought we couldn't build it. Um, cool. Yeah. So that's, that's a decent segue as well. But let me just finish my tour of this code. Um, I don't think Emmett's excited for C++ code, but it's... It's not very C++ E to me because it's not at least at this level object oriented. Uh, I guess it's using objects under the hood. Uh, but there's this big table of commands to functions. Um, so if you're doing command like 30, that's going to call disconnect. Um, and the one that I was looking at a lot, the, the one that frustrates me is connect, I think. Yeah, so this is in oh, start client TCP is one command. And it has these different variations of like a four, a four argument version versus a five argument version. And then there's types. So like type zero is TCP, type one is UDP apparently. And then two is SSL, TLS stuff. And if you look here, it checks the result and if the result is good, it gives us a parameter back. But if an error happens, it just responds with no parameters. <laughs> and I'm just like, ah! <laughs> like, I would love to be able to produce exceptions that are, like, reasonable. And, like, they're running embed TLS. And, like, it's just, it frustrates me to no end that, like, error messages or error codes are not returned across this boundary. Um... So the error that you get of like, I expected one, but got zero is like totally fair because it really has no idea what failed. It just knows that it did fail. Um, so yeah, that's a challenge working with the ESP32 spy. On Carlos, it's fine if you're late. You missed the puzzle though. I'll show you. I had the puzzle. This is the floor next to me. That's the current status of the puzzle. Um, but we have time codes. If you look up in the Discord, there's a link to the notes doc where we've gone over what we talked about and kind of like seeking into it. So you can go back and catch up. It's all good. But yeah, puzzles there. Um, okay, so I did a lot of work, and I think we know this. Like, I think I showed it on it. Um, with a cat around that sounds dangerous. Oh, let me tell you. Another detour. This puzzle usually sits on the coffee table in front of our couch. And so the cats get really hungry. And I'll usually be sitting there doing the puzzle when they're about to eat. There was one day... I didn't have it on this material. This is like a cork board. So it sticks pretty well. But... uh the older board that I had it on that's not quite big enough is just, like, straight, like, wood. And the other cat, Vin, was on it, and she, like, jumped off the puzzle, and it was, like, mostly done. And she slid the puzzle off the board, and, like, it went onto the floor and crumbled and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, and she, like, has been stepping on this one, and, like, it, the pieces stick to her her foot, and she, like, flings them off, so I have to get them, too. So, yeah, it is dangerous. Tigerbyte says, we have a lot of issues with not getting enough detail and error messages from uBlocks and Sierra modems. It's very frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, I believe it. I, I believe it wholeheartedly. Um, it's interesting, right? Like, you don't... When you're designing an API, like, you shouldn't hide error detail, but, like you may actually want to like rename or explain an error better. Um, which is interesting too. Um, okay. So basically I need to jump back in this ESP32 spy stuff because we're still seeing some errors and 
I've found some issues with uh, basically the socket implementation of ESP32 Spy is not that faithful to the way that sockets work in CPython. So like this goal I have of like having native Wi-Fi, CPython, and other implementations of socket all work together because they work the same way is like at this point they don't work the same way and like i can make requests work around it and if we look at the latest pr i did which i don't have open anymore apparently uh, if we see like this last pull request i did so the sends method in cpython tries to send bytes out and returns to you the number of bytes that were sent. If the socket is broken for some reason and you don't send anything, all it does is return zero. But that's not how the ESP32 spy version works. It actually, uh, so if we pull up the CPython docs, Python three socket. Right, like my goal is to work like this. So if we find send, oh, I just saw the word can. We've been making lots of can progress. So there's two APIs, there's send, and it says returns the number of bytes sent. Applications are responsible for checking that all data has been sent. If only some data was transmitted, the application needs to attempt delivery of the remaining data. Hmm. Are we doing that or are we doing this? Unlike send, this method continues to send data from bytes until either all data has been sent or an error occurs. None is returned on success. So <laughs> this method is called send all. And that's basically the way that send on the ESP32 spy socket works, which is like, I didn't even realize. Didn't even realize until I tried to like do all this unification stuff. Um, so what you see here is that in this change, I'm wrapping send. So here it says, send while I haven't sent everything, send. Oh, and if it returns none, this is the ESP32 spy case. Just say that everything was sent. If it's zero, we raise a runtime error. So that's the C Python way of saying like every, things are bad. And then otherwise we, we try to repeatedly send stuff. Um, so this is the like request level, like trying to work in both cases um, because like ESP32 spy socket send will raise an exception if it's unable to send everything as well. It basically works like send all. Uh, so the question is, is how do I get, how do I get the ESP32 spy library more aligned with the way that CPython works? And you saw me do a lot of this work previously. So what I've got, I have a couple options. One option I have is that I have my own version of requests that I did. It's on, oh, no, I'm in the wrong library. It's not called that. I have my own version of ESP32 Spy, call, and it's on my split branch. And one of the things that I didn't like about the ESP32 Spy library was that um, there's one giant file. Like, there's a, there's a lot of stuff packed into the same file. So this was work I did two months ago now, apparently. Um, trying to split everything apart. And I was also trying to like split this stuff apart to get an idea of what the native Wi-Fi API would be. So that's why it's been two months. Um, but one thing, so one option I have is I can basically dust this off, patch it in, do the same thing I did with the requests, which is um, try to provide the same APIs. So there's a couple major... There's a couple of major libraries that, that build on this, the Pi portal library and the matrix portal library. Those are not things that I want to break, although they're kind of broken right now, I think. Like I, I, I want to fix them, I want to improve them. I don't want to like have things worse. So one thing I could do is 
I can take this work I did and then plug it in with all of the existing other libraries and basically add, just like I did with the requests, add all of the old APIs back that I need uh, to mimic. Or the other thing I could do is that Dan started this Adafruit airlift library, which uh, we were talking about when he was adding the Lee coprocessor stuff. So um, as Anik Data said, uh, the new version of the Wi-Fi NINA firmware, 1.7.0, can also be a Bluetooth device. It cannot be them at the same time. Um, so there is this process of like, oh, I want it in Wi-Fi mode. I want it in Bluetooth mode. Um, and the question was, is like, where do you manage what of those two things it's doing? So we came up with this idea, like the Airlift is the brand for boards and devices that we do that. Um, so this, we kind of thought as the top level, like tracking which of the two modes you're in. So are you doing Bluetooth stuff or do you want to do Wi-Fi stuff? And so if we look at Adafruit Airlift, we've got this ESP32. So we have a separate module for the particular type of airlift there is in case there's ever a different type. And then um, it has this, uh, so it manages resetting the device and resetting into a different mode. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Mark. Mark made a PR to the Stemma Mox, Mock XO32 repo to update the uh, debug edge connector. But it says, uh, don't get distracted. <laughs> um. Yeah, so, so this airlift library is meant to be a top level switching between the two, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi is here as well, but it's stepped out. Uh, so the other approach I could do with the ESP32 spy stuff is to take that split library. I think what I would do is actually delete a lot of, delete the, the weird stuff. Like there's pin control, things like that, that, that I don't actually think need to be in that library. Um, basically take that original code that I did for the ESP32 spy, strip it down to just the socket stuff, and then um, commit it to this library instead. Um, or even a, a separate library from this. Uh, and basically not fix PyPortal with ESP32 spy, but once this other library with the stripped down version is in, move PyPortal and other stuff that uses ESP32 Spy to the new version. Um, <laughs> Avamander says, I'm wondering, do you write code in the same way? Fixing one thing and then finding another annoying thing, making it N plus one threaded. Um, yeah, I can definitely do that. <laughs> I could definitely get distracted by things as I, as I am fixing something else. I definitely do. Yeah. It can be, can be kind of dangerous. So I'm actually curious, like, what do people think? Like, do you think it's better for me to replace ESP32 Spy with the split version in a way that's backwards compatible, or should I give up on that? Yeah, so Anik Data says option two seems nice and clean, no disruption to the installed base. Yes, but Anik Data, the challenge is that um, it doesn't necessarily work that well, as you found out. So the, there might be some bugs in the existing combination of requests and ESP32 spy that are not that are kind of problematic. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's the question I really have to ask myself, which is, do the existing examples as they are today with the bundle of today, do they work well enough? And if they work well enough, I think Anecdata is right in that like, we can, we have a bit more time, we can do the stripped down version. Um, and then move things over to this like 
use a lot less memory and hopefully be faster sort of thing. Any, any, any folks who think the option one is actually better? I think it's, you know, it's a challenge, right? Like it's a challenge to change code without breaking it. And I'm not very good at that, as you've seen. I like changing code, but I, I, I do kind of play it a bit fast and loose. Um, so yeah, it's tricky. I really do like the idea of taking that, the ESP32 spy changes and stripping it down. It potentially would even give me a little bit more flex flexibility. Duke says I like the idea of splitting them up. Yeah, because I think yeah, I think you're right, and I think that's another reason is that there's some stuff in this ESP32 spy library where like we actually want it to be agnostic. So like for example, there's this Wi-Fi manager thing. And, like, there's no reason for Wi-Fi Manager to be specific to the ESP32 spy, right? Like, it's managing some secret stuff and, like, connecting to networks. Um, it's, like, trying to manage some reconnection things. It does a lot, which I don't like. Like, Wi-Fi Manager is wrapping requests and then like setting a NeoPixel status. So like that should be a separate thing as well. Yeah, I think I think splitting, like making smaller alternative libraries is the way to go. David says, so if I have an ESP32 S2 Feather and I add an airlift Feather Wing, will I be able to choose the one I want to use for connections? Yes, that's my idea, is that you would basically have two socket pools two sources of sockets and you would just create a request session for one or the other um, to choose between them like it's not going to do the stuff that like linux would do for you of like which network is up and which has as access to these things like you would have to manage all that but then you know it like then you have the advantage of managing it and you could know what um what you're using at all times but potentially you then layer on like a, you know, something that does a unified socket pool or something. I don't know. It is a different approach to what MicroPython took to, but we've, I think we've talked about that. Okay. So then the other question is, do I put it in the airlift library? Which I'm actually thinking maybe we don't. Like... I think maybe what we do is we like the airlift library would use it. Duke asks, at what point do you feel like a single library is getting too big and should be split up? Number of functions, diversity of functions. Yeah, I think that's a, Ooh, micro, micro dead. Distracted me says the deep sleep PR is in circuit Python. Yeah, I should plug that. But let me answer Duke's question first. Let's add that as a to do to talk about. Um, so I think that there's two questions uh, kind of around that. Like, what makes up a library? is different than what should be in a single file, also known as a module. So like modules should be small because that is the unit that you're importing code into memory. Um, and I do talk about this. Let me just plug the design guide a bit as well. And maybe let, I'll take a time code. This is something maybe I want to refer people to. Um, file size slash module. Um, so in CircuitPython, there's this design guide here. Um, it hasn't changed a lot. I did it a lot in the, like, the first year of CircuitPython. 
Um, but it talks about, I think it does. Use bus device. Ah, here's the little blurb I'm thinking. Lots of small modules. So lots of files that are small. CircuitPython boards tend to have a small amount of internal flash and a small amount of RAM, but large amounts of external flash for the file system. So create many small libraries that can be loaded as needed instead of one large file that does everything. So I think the ans to answer your question, Duke, it's there's no hard and fast rule about number of functions. Uh, I think you're getting closer to that in thinking of like diversity of functions, which is if you're doing this one thing, how many of these things do you also need access to, right? So if you're doing this one thing and uh, if you're doing this one thing and you don't need half the functions, like those should really be in a separate library that you can import separately. So like one thing that we're particularly bad at in our libraries, for example, is that like if we have a sensor, uh, like a temperature sensor, and you can talk to it both over spy and I'd squared C, like sometimes we're bad at and that we'll have like the code for both spy and I squared C in the same module in the same file. Um, which means that if you're using it over as good C, you've spent the cost of loading, um, <laughs> you spent the cost of loading, um, loading the, oh, Mark's asking me questions and distracting me. So yeah, let me finish. Libraries themselves are not that important because a library can consist of multiple modules. But modules themselves should be small uh, because those are the units that, uh, yeah, David points out he's done a few splitting of libraries and modules too. Yes. So this is the theory of like, you can keep track of like how big like the memory use of like, do see how much memory you have, import the thing and then, um, and then see how much memory you have after you import it. And that will give you a rule of thumb of like what sort of RAM usage you're doing. Um, so yeah, I definitely, I definitely bias that way. Um, smaller is better. And the way to know, like, what boundaries to place on, on what needs to go where is like, if you're trying to do something, which functions do you need to do that thing? And which ones do you not? Um, so yeah, I, I would say diversity. So like, in the example of, if we just look at the... ESP32 spy, right? And, and we're just looking at Wi-Fi manager, right? Like the other thing I like to think about is like, if I had to describe to you, like what does a Wi-Fi manager do? And this is why I like to think of software engineering as engineering of like, if I'm going through, a, if somebody's explaining like a motor to you, like they're going to say that's the transmission and it does this thing, right? Like software engineering is the same thing and at least object oriented design of like, this is a Wi-Fi manager. It manages Wi-Fi connections for you and the information that you need to make those connections, right? So if I'm going through here and I'm like, oh, okay, I get like I get why you're passing in secrets, right? Like that's where my credentials are. But then I see that you're ad asking for a status pixel and I'm like, okay, that may kind of make sense if I'm talking about like, am I connected or not? But then if I go down here and I'm like looking at the functions and I see, oh, okay, okay, connect, okay, create, like that's a little weird. Like Wi-Fi manager is also managing networks I'm creating. Like, I guess I wasn't that specific, but then I get down to like, oh, I'm doing get and post requests. And I'm like, interesting. <laughs> like that, that's just not managing Wi-Fi, right? Like at that point, you're not managing the Wi-Fi anymore. Um, and the reason that it's here, I think, is like, not only is it changing the, the status colors of the pixel, but it is also doing this like implicit connection. And I think that's why it's in here is that like, if you're trying to make an HTTP request, you already want to be connected to the Wi-Fi. And there's probably a different way of doing this where like, there's two levels of abstraction here, maybe not one, right? Like this is trying to be one, but like you could have one layer of abstraction that is managed of the connection and another that's like based on the connections set the NeoPixel colors, right? Um, so yeah, it's, 
Yeah, Johnny says it's the single responsibility rule. Um, and it just takes experience too, right? It takes, it takes, you know, reading reading code is a great way to learn this sort of stuff. Um, it, you know, it's a matter of reading a lot of code, taking a look at the documentation, understanding what it does, and then determining whether like it actually matches what you thought it was, right? Because, yeah, Johnny says it's hard, which it is, um, because the engineering part of engineering is all about abstraction. And it's true for software, it's true for hardware, it's true for mechanics, right? Is that like, I don't know how the transmission works, but I understand that you connect it to it here, here, and these wires, right? Like, I don't know how the transmission works, but I know the interface for it. And software is the same way. And that's, I think, why object-oriented programming is, is so popular, right? It's not the only way to do it, but it's so popular because you could say like, here's this, this thing, this abstract thing, and you can do this these things with it. You don't need to worry about how it works. Um, so yeah, that's kind of interesting. I think I think this is one of the topics that I'm like pretty good at. Like API design is something that Lamore has told me I'm good at, and that is largely uh, software engineering sort of stuff. So uh, it's worth talking about. <laughs> uh, it's hard to do, but it's also really important. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to do things well, um, and doing it in a backwards compatible way is like extra hard. Um, and that's kind of like in, in Google land, that's kind of how we do that. Duke says, I always get lost in that. I always want to know what is happening in between the out input and output and I never get anywhere. Yeah. I've totally seen that. Um, like it's very common for new grads like new software engineering grads to want to be able to read all the code. And in most places, I believe, where you're actually going to be programming, you simply can't do that. There is too much code. If you have to read everything, you'll never you'll never start coding. Um, so it's a matter of like trying to estimate or guess what the function of something is and then assuming that until you're proven wrong um, and if uh, an API is documented well and designed well like you should your assumptions should be correct and that's why like consistency is really important as well of like did you know that on our like we were just doing the can IO API and I should double check this actually but like what is the order of TX and RX on the in the constructor well it should match the order of the UART constructor because UART also has TX and RX. If you're doing like one thing I decided was for spy and I squared Z, the clock is always the first argument, right? So like consistency and design patterns, which is like a topic for software engineering, like it, those things, consistency and design patterns allow you to make assumptions up front that um, if you actually follow them, like they're true and they make it easier. Um, okay, and that's my software engineering detour. Um, I think that I've, I think you're right. I think the approach that I should take is um, just to wrap up this idea instead of fully going back to it is uh, like, I think the, I think the approach to take is to split it into a, a singular smaller library and then I'll just port PyPortal over. PyPortal itself is just the class is just this monster as well. And, and maker Melissa has been doing some good work and to try to split the, the matrix portal version of that apart of it as well, because it manages Wi-Fi and requests. Like there's a W get function. Um, Ooh, empty Roberts 1243 says, I just saw Blinka and some console output on the SH 1107 feather wing. That's super exciting. Okay, let's, um, congrats, Mark. Nice work. Let's wrap that up. Let's talk about this. Let's highlight another community contribution. Um, and this is definitely relevant to ESP32 Spy, but more broadly relevant as well. So Microdev has been doing some really cool contributions. And one thing that they wanted to add was... 
Sweet. Fetty2 says it looks like Ken and you are RTXRX in the same order. Um, so MicroDev and I have been having lots of discussions about deep sleep support in CircuitPython, and they are targeting the ESP32-S2 at the start. Um, have we talked about... Um, <laughs> David says you are so right, Scott. Thank you. I assume that's on the engineering stuff. Um, have we talked about sleep at all on this? I, we could go over it basically. Um, I think there are generally two types of sleep. So what is sleep and why would you want it? And I did take a type code. So um, when your CPU is running, it's changing transistors <laughs> um, so your CPU, like the puzzle, I wish I knew the general layout of this. Um, if we look at the, the puzzle, oh, well, I guess if the puzzle, <laughs> if the puzzle was done more, it would be more helpful. Um, but basically what happens is that in a CPU, it is a machine that is operating on data. It is operating on bits, which are high and low signals. And you get an instruction, which is a number of bits. And based on that instruction, you perform some math on or, or logic on internal or like input data bits. So what, when your code is running, you have this clock source that is basically incrementing the logic in a circle, kind of in a circle. Uh, I learned CPU design in like in college just briefly, uh, but the idea it, it's showed as like a pipeline. Yeah, David's agreeing me like code and hardware is too complex now. We need documentation and the ability to abstract. Yeah, um, yeah. So so basically, when a CPU is running, all the transistors are changing as the data flows through the logic that's that's made up of it and that takes energy T transitioning um transitioning transistors up and down and like currents moving and that generates heat which is power and basically you're going to drain your batteries when the, when that's happening and it also if you're not clocked if you're just holding uh state there it still takes power as well so at the highest level, like when your CPU is running, you're using the most energy. Um, but what you can do is you can do a number of things to reduce the amount of, of energy that you're taking in. Uh, so if you don't have any logic to run, for example, the very first thing you can do is you can stop clocking the CPU. So it won't run any logic, but it will kind of freeze in place and know where it was, know what all the data was. Um, and that's kind of the like lightest level of sleep because everything else is still running and active. Um, and that's kind of what my work for s the initial sleep work in CircuitPython would do is just like, if you're doing time.sleep and we don't have anything else to do, like just pause the CPU to save a little bit of memory uh, or a little bit of power um, when you're doing that. Now, there's also like... Uh, other things you can do to save more power in that state of like the CPU is still alive and it remembers everything. Uh, for example, you can turn the power off to like peripherals like SPI or I squared Z that you're not using. Um, or you can turn the clock off to something and have those pauses pause as well. Um, but that's only that only gets you so far. That's what I would consider kind of a light sleep because everything is active and pause and you can resume very quickly at any time um now microdev has been working on deep sleep which is not that is not true so the cpu can get the power turned off to it and the ram can turn the you can turn off the power to the ram as well um and that saves you a lot of power because like you don't care about the state you're gonna forget it and uh it can just be straight up off um, and then what happens is that you have a, it's usually, uh, you have a portion of the chip that you do keep on. It's just not the high powered processor and it's not the peripherals. 
it may be a very limited, it's usually a very limited set of things, uh, including a real-time clock. So if you wanted to say, like, I'm going to completely shut down except in 10 minutes I'm going to wake up, like, the thing that's keeping track of when it, whether it's 10 minutes is uh, the thing that you have to keep the power to. And, and that area of the chip is typically designed to be very low power. Um, and Fede2 asks, like, what is it using the ULP for this? And that's the ultra low power, or, or I don't know what it stands for. It's basically a CPU core that is very, very um, slow because the more clocks you have, the more power you, you do. But it also, um, it, it is still a CPU. So it allows you to run logic slowly uh, that could then potentially wake up the, the higher pad, the, the higher power stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, deep sleep is this idea that like the main CPU and the main memory are turned completely off. And that's like, w what that means for CircuitPython is that when you go to deep sleep, you lose where you were in your code.py. Like um, you're completely off and like, there is some RAM that sticks around, but it's not enough RAM for us to like keep track of like, um, it's not enough RAM for us to keep track of like all of the things you imported and like all of the CircuitPython state, like it's just not enough. Um, Johnny says modern low power MCUs use sub micro amps in deep sleep mode. Yeah, like this is what they're known for. This is why you can have like on my keys, I have like a tile device, right? Like this device here and it's seeing my face. Like you can have it on your keys and it's got a microcontroller in it that can do Bluetooth, but most of the time it's in deep sleep. Um, it's just doing very little work and you can use a coin cell battery and have it last a year or two. Um, just because like most of the time the chip's not doing anything, which means it's using not very much power. Um, so Microdev's been working on deep sleep, which is super exciting and just made this draft PR as a way for us to have um, some discussion around API design, which I think we talked about last week. I think we did. Cause I think I remember saying like, I like the API. So there's two issues. Like I forget what they're called. One is this hibernate and that's this uh, sleep until an alarm. So I added, after MicroDev and I had a discussion, I added examples here. And I realize you can't see it. Ah, did I beat? <laughs> um, so this is issue 2795. Um, <laughs> Fede2 is downloading the branch and testing. Um, yeah, this is why I thought it would be cool for to show folks. If you want to help uh, test and try it out and and decide on what the the thing should be. So did I cover this already? I'm just off of it today. Did I talk about these examples? I know I did with MicroDev, but I don't think I have on the stream. So basically there's these like two different styles of sleep that I want to support in CircuitPython. Um, there's light sleep and deep sleep. And light sleep is this idea that like, I'm just gonna pause everything, but then I wanna continue from where I left off. So that's this, uh, this case here. And this is the case I think is easier where you say, oh, I'm gonna import the supervisor, which is the thing that manages what's running. And then I want two different types of alarms. I want a pin level. So I wanna say like, wake me up if IO zero is true, um, or wake me up after a second. And then <laughs> Mark's complaining because it's late. He wants to, he wants, we, we need to put Mark into deep sleep mode as well. Um, so because this is a light sleep, we can put it into a while true. So we can just say, uh, let's go to a light sleep. Uh, wake me up with these two alarms. And then uh, depending on which alarm woke us up, uh, do something and then loop around and, and sleep again. Um, all the Europeans are, don't like me talking about sleep. So that's one way. And I, I like this approach, um, but it's only so good, which is what MicroDev has been talking about. Um, being able to deep sleep, 
allows you to uh, save a lot more memory because you can you don't need RAM anymore. So t thinking of that original example, um, this is an example where you're basically like inside that while true loop, where um, you wake up or you alarm up, uh, an alarm wakes you up, you run some code, you set new alarms, and then you go back to deep sleep. And so it, it's similar, you import the same alarms, but you can get the current alarm, compare it to the new alarms that you created, um, or do something with the, the alarm that you get back. And then you set the new alarms that you want. You do the thing based on the alarm, which is the same as the while true loop. And then you, uh, my two hours are up. Yeah, sorry. I, I think I'm just about done. Um, there's nothing else in the list. Um, but then you set the alarms again and you exit because like, remember everything goes on. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. European folks. They're saying that like, it's tough staying up late because tomorrow's a work day. I'm sorry about that. All right. Well, we can call it. Oh yes. Mark, Mark wants. Okay. Let's talk about, uh, Mark's question. And then I'll let the Europeans go to bed. Thank you for hanging out. I appreciate it. Double I2C on Stemma Mach 32. Um, yeah, so Mark asked. I sent them to deep sleep. I haven't exited yet. So Mark points out that on the schematic for the... Mo Stemma Mach 32, there, the SDA and SCL 3 volts are connected to two different positions. Um, and that is deliberate. <laughs> uh, and the re reason that it is intentional is that I actually do potentially want to have two different I squared C peripherals running in the same chip um, because there is essentially a kind of you could think of it as a bootloader like a configuration inter interface for the for the FPGA that is on fixed pins so if you enable it it's actually like hardware hardware it's not in in the like gates um and it's it's limited to two specific pins and so that's the the configuration is on two specific pins and then the um the other two pins I picked because I also want to be able to put a, an I squared C device in the fabric uh, or like in the bitstream uh, as a like user I squared C. So the second one is for, yeah, it's, it's not. So there's two hardware, hard I squared C devices on the mock device on the mock XOs, uh, two, three and three D, not the, not the original mock XOs. So there's two hardware I squared C's. One can be used as configuration. The other one can only be used as um, the user, a user one. And so what I want to be able to do is actually do, um, I, I, I have to have those two connected because uh, the configuration one is set to two spin pins specifically. And then I have to have two other pins to connect to the second hardware I squared C for the user. Um, but I want to use that second hard drive I squared C in some cases as another device on the same bus as the configuration. <laughs> um, so I think it should be okay because the two pins, hopefully that I picked default to um, high Z. So they shouldn't impact the uh, state of it, uh, but I could be wrong. So that's like one thing I have to look at, but it is deliberate that it's connected to two different spots. Um, it's because I want to have two I squared C endpoints. Basically, it's actually funny because the configuration, the configuration mode of the I squared C device actually has three different I squared C addresses that it responds to, like one for configuration, one for resetting the logic, and one for something else. So if all is working, you would actually get four I squared C addresses when you scan for it. Um, but yeah, so that's deliberate. I don't think that's a problem. It could be the problem, but I don't think it is. Um, yeah, so Me6 asks, asks, which mock XO2 part is it? And it's either of the two um, 
It's either of the two thirty two QFN ones. David asks, so will you be able to bridge or selectively filter what you pass from one side to the other? Are you talking about like from the A A zero through seven to B zero through seven? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the sides. So if you look on the mock XO2 page um, and you scroll down to the 32 pin QFN, there's two options, the XO1200 and the XO256. Um, either one of those will work. Uh, they are pin compatible. So it should be the case that, and maybe this is my problem and I'm wrong, um, I, I know it. I know it's not because the tiny FPGA AX series is is the same PCB layout, just with one or the other of these placed. Um, they're they're pin compatible. Um, oh, for the I squared C, so so they will both be I squared C peripherals. So they they will be kind of unrelated to each other. One will be interfacing, f like. One is just for configuration, and the other one is just for you talking to whatever you've loaded on there. Um, but yeah, I want to do similar things for larger footprints as well. I just wanted to start with the, the simplest and hopefully lowest cost version. Um. <laughs> All right, I think we should wrap it up. So uh, thank you all for the, the discussion as always. Thanks for hanging out. Um, I think the conclusion is, is that for the ESP32 spy work, I'll take my split branch and I will either integrate it into Airlift or I'll create a new library that will do just the socket stuff for the ESP32 spy. Um, we'll have to figure out how to test that, uh, but it should be much more tractable um, than what we've got. Um, it's possible we actually might get two libraries out of that as well because there's some generic like how do I send a command stuff that um, might be useful separately. Um, Fede2 asks, can I buy a tiny FPGA and use it to test your code? Yeah, basically. It's very much a similar board. It just doesn't have this Temic UT on it. Um, I don't know. Maybe I... If you can get it, I don't think they're that available, the tiny FPGA AX2. I don't think they're that available, but if you can find it, then yeah, sure. I had to like I had to order it from Oshpark and assemble it myself. Which this one does work. I was having some issues with I was actually having some issues with getting the like dual icebird C connected up. So I'm gonna have to figure that out. Local provider has one, yeah. Yeah, the AX2 is the larger version as well, I think. Um, and they're pretty cheap. Like, they're like $13 and $18 US. Yeah, this is a lot more expensive than what they were listed at. But this has probably already been imported for you. Um, but yeah. Yeah, this is the this is what I'm talking about, is the Mach XO2 1200. Um, and you could just breadboard it to basically be equivalent, for sure. You can help me. <laughs> you can help me uh, since I don't have much time for it. Um, cool. Thanks, Alvaro, as always. And thank you all again. Um, sorry for those of you who are staying up late that it's a work day tomorrow. Um, next week, I'm planning on doing it on Friday. Fridays are my default. Um, the thing I actually have going on tomorrow is we have house cleaners and window cleaners coming tomorrow. And I just didn't want to have to manage that. Um, so maybe like the house cleaners come once a month. So maybe that will be my Thursday. Um, and then, but then again, two weeks from today, I will also stream uh, because the cat is going in for surgery on the f two weeks from tomorrow. Um, next week, next week is Friday. Um, anyway, uh, thank you all. Please, again, uh, I should plug Adafruit. Uh, they pay me to work on this. They pay me to stream. Um, you can go to adafruit.com. There's this really cool board that just was released this morning that, or yesterday that they might have, um, the QT Pi. I just ordered it. It's already out of stock, which is good news. 
Um, it is now $6. I think it was $5 last night. A very inexpensive. It's a Atmel SAMD21, and it's got a Stemma QT. So it'll be great for interfacing with this Stemma FPGA stuff if, if it ever gets going. Uh, but lots of lots of handy projects that it's useful for. Um, so I just ordered one of those for myself. And I actually did um, Lemoore's throwing in a prototype for an IMX Metro, uh, which is cool, but it doesn't work yet. So I'm going to see if I can get that working as well. Um, so please, please, please support Adafruit. Um, it's uh, tough times for companies um, just because of the economy and the pandemic. So uh, Adafruit's done its best to keep everybody employed and, and paid. I just got paid today, yesterday. Um, so help them out, help me out, uh, by going to adafruit.com, uh, like the video on YouTube, as Alvaro says, um, if you want to chat, if you have questions for me or some other folks, you can go to the Adafruit discord server, which is adafru.it slash discord. We're there all week. I try to avoid it on the weekends, but I'm happy to answer questions and redirect you to other folks or other folks will answer before I get a chance to, um, please hang out there. And uh, with that, I'll see you all next week. Um, should I go back to Puzzle Cam? Uh, thank you, everybody. I, I really appreciate it. I'll see you next week. Here's my foot. <laughs>